Welcome to Audit the Audit, where we sort out the who and what and the right and wrong of police interactions. This episode covers lawful searches, citizen conduct, and department policy, and is brought to us by the Denver Post channel. Be sure to check out the description below and give them the credit that they deserve. Before we dive into the interaction, I want to give a big thanks to the sponsor of this episode, Raycon. If you've been looking for the perfect pair of earbuds that sound great, fit right, and match your style, then look no further than the Raycon Everyday Earbuds. Each pair of Raycon earbuds offers up to 8 hours of playtime, 32 hours of total battery life, seamless Bluetooth tooth pairing and booming bass, along with optimized gel tips that stay comfortably in your ear no matter what you're doing. With Raycon, you get quality audio at half the price of other premium audio brands and a variety of colors and styles to complete your look. So it's no wonder Raycon's everyday earbuds have over 48,000 five-star reviews. I've been using Raycon's everyday earbuds for years now, and not only do they sound amazing, but they fit great and never fall out no matter what I'm doing. Click on the link in my description or go to buy Raycon com slash audit to get 15% off your order and choose the color that fits your style. Thanks again to Raycon for sponsoring this episode. On April 27, 2020, 25-year-old Keelan Hill called 911 after being involved in a minor traffic accident with two unidentified citizens along Interstate 25 near Denver, Colorado. Officer Thomas Ludwig from the Denver Police Department arrived on the scene and began questioning the other two citizens involved in the crash, while Mr. Hill was being assessed by the paramedic inside the ambulance. The bus. Okay. Okay, let's go talk about it over here, man. Okay. Tell me what happened exactly. After exiting the ambulance, Mr. Hill confronts one of the Denver officers after noticing him searching his vehicle without his consent. The officer tells Mr. Hill that he had detected the odor of marijuana from inside the vehicle and implied that the smell granted him the authority to search. Whether or not the odor of marijuana alone grants officers the authority to search a vehicle is a complicated question, and the answer varies from state to state, as does the legality of medical and recreational marijuana. In Colorado, where recreational marijuana was legalized in 2012, the odor of marijuana is still a relevant factor in the totality of the circumstances test and can contribute to the probable cause necessary to search a vehicle. The Colorado Supreme Court held in the 2016 case of People v. Zuniga that, quote, while Amendment 64 allows possession of one ounce or less of marijuana, a substantial number of other marijuana-related activities remain unlawful under Colorado law. Given that state of affairs, the odor of of marijuana is still suggestive of criminal activity. In this case, there were other factors that contributed to the probable cause finding, and the court did not rule on whether the odor of marijuana alone is sufficient to permit an officer to search a vehicle. In the 2017 Colorado Court of Appeals case of People v. McKnight, a concurring opinion concluded that when a canine was trained to detect marijuana, quote, a drug detection dog's alert does not alone give a Colorado state law enforcement officer probable cause to conduct a search of a vehicle where the occupants are at least 21 years old. The Colorado Supreme Court reviewed this case in 2019, but it did not weigh in on whether the mere odor of marijuana or a drug dog's alert alone was enough to give an officer probable cause of search. However, as the Supreme Court of Nebraska explained in the 2018 case of State v. Seckinger, quote, Most state and federal courts agree that the odor of marijuana alone furnishes probable cause for a warrantless search of the vehicle from which the odor emanates. Even among states that have passed laws allowing medical or recreational marijuana use, many courts continue to recognize that marijuana is contraband and that the odor of marijuana can provide probable cause to search a vehicle. Although the state of the law in Colorado is not entirely clear, it is certainly possible possible that a court could conclude the officer had probable cause to search the vehicle based on the odor of marijuana alone, or in combination with the description of Mr. Hill's behavior during the accident. What the f what are you doing? Stepping to me, huh? What the f is it's in my face? What Don't think so, dude. What is this? Oh, what, what, what am I? What the f what are you stopping the cops for, man? I did not ask you to get no, out of my car. No, I watch you. I got you on my video camera. I asked you to get out of my car. That's it. You're being an asshole to everybody. I'm not. Yes, you are. What just happened? 
Yeah, you got an ankle monitor too, huh? Wow. I'm probation. I'm sure uh, I'm not on probation. the probation officer's going to love that. I'm not on probation at all. So, yeah. You double off these. Oh, what, what am I going to jail for? What am I abused for? We'll, we'll let you know here in the field, okay? Mr. Hill asks the officers why he's being arrested, and the officer tells him that they will let him know soon. However, it does not appear that Mr. Hill violated any Colorado laws by aggressively approaching the officer to argue about the vehicle. In some instances, it is possible that aggressive conduct could be considered to be the crime of menacing, which an individual commits if, quote, by any threat or physical action, he or she knowingly places or attempts to place another person in fear of imminent serious bodily injury, according to Section 18-3-206 of the Colorado Revised Statutes. Section 18-1-901 of the Colorado Revised Statutes defines serious bodily injury as, quote, bodily injury which, either at the time of the actual injury or at a later time, involves a substantial risk of death, a substantial risk of serious permanent disfigurement, a substantial risk of protracted loss or impairment of the function of any part or organ of the body, or breaks, fractures, or burns of the second or third degree. In the 1999 case of People v. Salt Tray, Division 4 of the Colorado Court of Appeals explained that when determining if an individual committed the crime of menacing, quote, the proper focus is on the intent and conduct of the actor and not the victim. The current statute requires the prosecution to prove that defendant acted knowingly, i.e., that he was aware that his conduct was such that it was practically certain to place the victim in fear of imminent serious bodily injury. If the actions of the perpetrator would reasonably cause fear of imminent serious bodily injury in the victim, menacing has been committed. In this situation, it is highly unlikely that Mr. Hill could be convicted of menacing for simply approaching the officer aggressively. Although it is possible that the officer was afraid that he might be injured, it would be entirely unreasonable for a court to conclude from Mr. Hill's conduct that he was intending to place the officer in fear of serious bodily injury. While Mr. Hill did get very close to the officer and pointed his finger in his face, nothing in his body language suggested that he was intending to cause any sort of physical harm to the officer, let alone serious bodily injury. A reasonable officer would not be placed in fear of death, serious permanent disfigurement, loss or impairment of the function of any part or organ of the body, breaks, fractures, or burns by an individual arguing with him and pointing at him. My car just got Which one's mine? Yeah. Let's go to my car. Come on. No. What? All I asked was you to get out of my car. After this man, he's gonna my face. Sir, I asked you to get out of my car. I'm gonna see if you're intoxicated. It feels like feeding there. I'm not intoxicated at all. Go ahead and have a seat in there. Go for it. Please go for it. Okay, have a seat. Y'all are illegally searching my car. Have a seat. Have a seat. Put your feet up. Push yourself all the way back. It is hard for me to determine if I am injured at the okay. moment, sir. So here's the thing. If you say that you have injuries, I'm going to do something different, okay? If you say that you don't have any injuries, then that means that nothing has happened and I can let you drive away. Sir, I believe I have... But if you're telling me something different, sir, then I have sir, to do something different. Sir, so just tell me if you have any injuries. I am telling you that it's hard for me to determine that at the moment. I will have to be able to do that. When I go to the hospital after I am released from your house custody. What is your name? My name is Keon. Okay, it Keon. It's hard for me to determine if I'm injured at the moment. If you're not injured from my officer. Sir, I. it is hard for me to determine that at the moment I have to go to the hospital. For what? The officer asks Mr. Hill if he sustained any injuries from the officers, and Mr. Hill tells the officer that he's unable to make that determination and would like to go to the hospital. According to the American Bar Association standards for criminal justice police function standards, police have, quote, complex and multiple tasks to perform in addition to identifying and apprehending persons committing serious criminal offenses. Some of these tasks include providing assistance to citizens in need of help, aiding individuals who are in danger of physical harm, and assisting those who cannot care for themselves. In line with these duties, the Denver Police Department Operation Manual's Use of Force Policy 105.01 states that, quote, Officers are required to provide medical attention as soon as practicable. 
Upon taking an individual into custody, arresting officers have the duty to exercise reasonable care for the arrestee's health and safety. The policy also dictates that, quote, arrestees suffering from any illness, injury, or other condition that requires medical attention will be evaluated by medical personnel. It is the policy of the Denver Sheriff Department to refuse custody of injured individuals, unless accompanied by reports indicating that they have been examined, treated, or have refused to submit to examination or treatment by medical personnel. Additionally, when an individual is injured or claiming injury resulting from contact with a police officer, the policy requires that, quote, the involved officer will visually examine the person displaying or claiming injury, request medical attention, and immediately notify a supervisor whenever injury results from force used by department personnel, or he or she is in contact with a person with obvious or alleged injuries who may claim they resulted from the contact contact with the officer. In these situations, quote, medical treatment at the scene is deemed the most appropriate response, though safety concerns may necessitate moving the individual to another location before treatment can occur. Medical personnel will determine whether further treatment is required. Because Mr. Hill stated he did not know if he was injured, it's unclear to what degree this policy would apply. However, it is clear that officers have a duty to care for the health of individuals who are in their custody, and this officer's callous indifference to Mr. Hill's medical condition was at best, highly unprofessional. At worst, the officer's statements could be construed as a threat to arrest Mr. Hill if he claimed that he was injured, and a promise to let him go free if he agreed that the officers had not injured him. I just had a car wreck. I was just stabbed in the neck. I didn't ask you about the car wreck. I asked you if my officer sir, hurt you. Sir, I called y'all about, about this car wreck that just happened. I was arrested and detained because of it. I called y'all because I was injured. From and what did I just ask you? I don't know where, who injured me or what injured me. Don't uh -huh. get in my face. I can, I can hear I you. I don't know who injured me or what injured me. I know I sustained some sort of injury. What? I'm, sir, I cannot determine that until I go to, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a doctor. I don't know. I just know I need to go to a doctor very soon. Does your car have a cage? Okay. Does your car have a cage? No. Okay. He's, we got to do paper on him, okay. so we're done. We're so done. I'm, Which car do you want to put him in? I'm literally telling y'all that I haven't. Which car do you want to put him in? Come on. What have I done? So what, what, have I, what have I done? Sir. Whoa. Grab a seat. Grab a seat. Thank you. Put your feet in. Put your feet in. Sir, okay, I, you know what? Put your feet in the car. I already talked to you, didn't I? Sir, Grab I, a seat. Put your feet I, in I there. I told you that I'm, look, I'm just trying to go home. Someone hit my car and y'all are taking me to jail? Like, come on, gee, this doesn't even sound right. It doesn't even sound right, bro. Someone hit put my car. Put your feet in there. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Once the officers managed to secure Mr. Hill in their patrol car, they towed his vehicle and took him to jail, where he spent the next 24 hours. Mr. Hill was charged with interference with police activity, which is a municipal violation, but the charges were later dropped. Mr. Hill went on to file a lawsuit against the city of Denver and three of the officers involved in the encounter for allegedly violating his First and Fourth Amendment rights, and claimed that he missed a final exam for his master's degree in business administration while he was in jail. As of the writing of this episode, the lawsuit is still ongoing. Overall, the Denver officers get an F. Because although it is possible that the officers were within their authority to search Mr. Hill's vehicle, they arrested Mr. Hill for conduct that was not illegal, violated departmental policy by refusing Mr. Hill's request for medical aid, and maintained a hostile and unprofessional demeanor throughout the encounter. When Mr. Hill confronted the officer who was searching his vehicle, the officer responded by matching the aggressive nature of Mr. Hill's inquiry, rather than making an effort to de-escalate the situation. It is in these pivotal and often emotionally charged moments that employing the use of de-escalation has the potential to dramatically impact the outcome of any given encounter, and it is the responsibility of members of law enforcement to recognize and take advantage of these instances. It is entirely possible that a court may view Mr. Hill's initial detention as lawful, considering the totality of circumstances, but the decision to arrest Mr. Hill was wholly unnecessary and likely unconstitutional. This interaction highlights how quickly a failure to de-escalate can evolve into police misconduct, and the important role that emotional and situational awareness plays in police interactions. 
Mr. Hill gets an A-, minus because although he could have invoked his right to silence more tactfully, he rightfully challenged the legitimacy of the officer's conduct, remained relatively compliant given the circumstances, and followed up this interaction with the proper legal action. There's no denying that aggressively walking toward an officer is probably not a good idea. Regardless of the context, however, nothing Mr. Hill did warranted an arrest, and his behavior was largely exacerbated by the aggressive response of the officers. I commend Mr. Hill for challenging the legitimacy of the officer's conduct and following up this encounter with the proper legal action. Interestingly enough, this is not the first episode of ATA featuring an encounter involving Mr. Hill. The second video ever uploaded to this channel showcased an interaction involving Mr. Hill and the West Des Moines Police Department. ATA has evolved considerably since the release of that episode, and I want to thank all of you who have supported this channel over the years and made it possible for ATA to continue covering these interactions. I want to extend that thanks to all of the informed citizens and diligent members of law enforcement who provide a framework for this channel to exist, including people like Mr. Hill. Let us know if there's an interaction or legal topic you would like us to discuss in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to check out my second channel for even more police interaction content.